Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, I'd like to welcome you to our program tonight. Um, it's, it's heartwarming and very wonderful to see such a large attendance at this program uh, in support of an exhibition that I think that we all, um, uh, if you haven't seen it, you should see it as soon as possible. But one that brings back um, very, very um, warm, good memories and just memories of a, of a time that's gone by. But it's good to see these images again. And so tonight we're going to celebrate um, the people that are responsible for bringing us uh, these images for us to remember for a lifetime. But first I'd like to just go over some housekeeping notes. One is, could you please turn off anything with the on and off switch? Uh, that's the cell phones, the laptops, the iPads, everything. And just wanted to remind you also that any, any uh, recording of this program is uh, prohibited. Secondly, um, this program is, is a live webcast. So it is being viewed all around the world, as a matter of fact. And um, uh, because of that, we ask you to present your questions at the end of the program at either of the microphones in the aisles. And that's so that our viewing audience can hear the question as well as the answer. So we're going to proceed with tonight's program by, uh, uh, I'm going to introduce um, Larry Schiller. And then Mr. Schiller will uh, come and introduce our three photographers. But let me just share a little bit um, about Mr. Schiller uh, for a few minutes. Lawrence Schiller was born in 1936 in Brooklyn, New York, and grew up in San Diego, California. While in high school, he spent his summers working for Acne News Service in New York City, where in 1953, at the age of 16, he got his first taste of photojournalism when he photographed the protests opposing the execution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, convicted spies for the Soviet Union. It wasn't long before he was working for publications such as Paris Match, Life Magazine, the London Sunday Times, Stern, and the Saturday Evening Post as a photojournalist. He published his first book, LSD, in 1966, which was based on a life cover story he did. Since then, he has published 11 books, including W. Eugene Smith's Minimata, Annie Lieberitz, Mary Ellen Mark, and Norman Mailer's Marilyn. He collaborated with Albert Goodman on Ladies and Gentlemen, Lenny Bruce, and again with Mailer on The Executioner's Song and Oswald's Tale. He has produced and or directed 22 motion pictures and miniseries for television, including The Executioner's Song and Peter the Great, which won six Emmys. His editorial direction of the documentary, The Man Who Skied Down Everest, won an Academy Award for its, producer, for its producers. And in the mid-90s, he began writing books. American Tragedy, one of his five books, became a New York Times number one bestseller. Currently, he works as a consultant to major companies, and here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, where he created and staged the current exhibition on John F. Kennedy, entitled American Visionary, John F. Kennedy's Life and Times. The exhibition closes on September 17th. I strongly recommend that you see it before that time. Plan to come back a couple of times, as a matter of fact. So we're going to finish showing you some of the images that Mr. Schiller has taken. It's one of my favorites.
please join me in welcoming Mr. Larry Schiller to the stage. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I lived on the West Coast most of my life as a photographer, and uh, I think I got into photography because I was uh, highly dyslexic. I couldn't read and I couldn't spell, and I kind of went towards what I could do, and that's taking pictures. Uh, as I mentioned to somebody earlier, and I'll be brief, I'll just tell you two little war stories. The first one was the first photographer I ever met in my life was a woman photographer. And it was very, very important to me because it did shape me in a lot of ways. And she was a woman by the name of uh, Margaret Burke White who had done the first life cover, first fortune cover. And I met her in the elevator at the Time Life Building. I was 18 years old. And I just had my first picture published which was the one of Julie Newmar with all the people in midair. And she said to me, you better be alive when you die. <laughs> and it stayed with me a long time. The other war story, before I just introduce photographers that are really celebrities here, is you saw a picture of Marilyn Monroe there, a uh, couple. And uh, I was in her dressing room one day. There was a picture of her with Paula Strasberg there, black and white. And she said to me, Larry, what would happen if I jumped in the swimming pool with my bathing suit on during this movie but came out with nothing on? And I said, well, Marilyn, cocky as I was a little bit then, I still am maybe, uh, I said, well, you're already famous, but now you're going to make me famous. <laughs> and she looked at me and says, don't be so cocky, Larry, I can fire you in two seconds. <laughs> and uh, Marilyn had been run over by a lot of trucks by that time in her life when I met her. I was 24 years old. And uh, uh, tragically, I did some of the last pictures. Uh, but we're here really to celebrate uh, really three extraordinary photographers who are legends to me because living out on the West Coast, these were the photographers I saw published all the time. And I used to say, just why couldn't I get an ex assignment like that with a president or with this and that? So Sharon Farmer is somebody who was like a, a mystery to me. It, she was a White House, uh, director of the White House Photography Office from 1999 to 2001, I think. And since 1993, she was a White House photographer. She documented, I think better than anybody else, the Clinton-Gore administration, and I think remained friends with those politicians over the years. She majored in photography, and I think what aided her, in some ways, like all artists get aided, was her love of music, which she studied at Ohio State University, where she received her, her bachelor's degree. If anybody is a professional photojournalist, she is. She's had exhibitions for over 40 years. I've just had my first, and she's had them for 40 years, so I really feel uh, you know, I, I got a lot of catching up to do. She's covered news stories, political campaigns, cultural events, conferences, and, you know, and her portraits are quite outstanding. Over the year, like the publications I worked for, she worked for the Washington Post. She lives right here in Washington, still lives not too far away. Smithsonian Institution, the American Association of Advancement of Science, the Leadership Conference on Civil Human Rights and the National Urban League, the Brooks Institute, are just a few of the organizations that she has shot for and exhibited. I think what really points out is that her photographic work resides not only in the Clinton Presidential Library, but in the National Archives. It's going to be there forever. The Library of Congress, Howard University's Moreland Collection, and the South African Museum in Peoria are just a few of the institutions and collections. They're all over the world. So Sharon, come on up here and uh, join us if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Larry. 
I mean, I get excited when I meet these legends. I mean, seriously, you know, I ran away from photography and made movies, but there she's, she's stuck it out for all those years. Dennis Brock is a, a legend also unto himself. He goes way back into the political, from JFK to today. I think he's photographed probably more presidents than anybody and continues his coverage and I think he's going to be around for a lot of years. He's, uh, he's not giving up and uh, he's lived with the new technology and he's shaped it and, and he, he knows what to, to do with it. He started, I think, with Charlie Block, at, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, Black Star. At least that's where I saw his first pictures. And over the years, like all of us, he published in Life, Newsweek, and there was a period of time can you believe this, where every single week, for like months after months, one of his pictures were in Time Magazine. You couldn't open a copy of the magazine without seeing his work. He did his really an incredible, the first major story on the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. And his pictures from that not only won awards, but they wound up in Newsweek, US News, Perry Match, every magazine in the world. He was the first in there, and fortunately, he was the first out, and he's still with us. For 25 years, he's been the Secretary Treasurer of the United States Senate Standing Committee on Press Photographers. So when you get that type of a position by your peers, it's something that you're proud of. He's the president of the White, was president of the White House Press Photographers Association, and last year, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the White House News Photographers Association. Like many of the Time Magazine photographers, and they were really shaped, you know, life may have had more pages, but with Time Magazine, you had to tell a story in a single picture, and Dennis was able to do that. You know, you had to really look and you had to say, how am I gonna say this in a single picture? Because Time only had one or two columns, you were lucky if you got something bigger, and Dennis knew how to master that. His work is now at the University of Texas. His collection is there. It's going to be preserved forever. Uh, and they sponsored recently a major exhibit of his work and at the Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. A guy who I wanted to chase after. Dennis, come on up here and join us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Marilyn was the first blonde I really met, but uh, Dan Walker is one that you never forget. <laughs> she was a contract photographer from a very early period of time with Time Magazine for many, many years. Uh, Washington was her home base. Uh, she was a member of the White House Press Photographers Association, the World Press. She won awards from the National Press Photographers Association. Her photographs are in the Art Institute of Chicago, and it's a pretty heavy place to have your work. Minneapolis Museum of Art, Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, it's not easy to get in there, and the National Museum of American History. Her work has been exhibited since all over the world since 2003. In 2014, she received from Time Incorporated the Henry Luce Achievement Award. For those that don't know who Henry Luce was, he started Fortune Magazine, he started Life. He had a dream of how to communicate to the American people in words and pictures. It was way before television took all the advertising dollars away from those magazines. Uh, her work is at the University of Texas also. She's the author of numerous books, Public and Private, 20 Years of Photography of the Presidency, which was published by National Geographic in 2002. The Big Picture, published also by Nat Geo in 2007, and a woman that she's followed, I don't know whether, how close, but nobody's got anything more personal on Hillary Clinton than uh, Diane did. And that book was published by Simon & Schuster in 2014. 
She lives with her husband, uh, Mallory, and also in Washington, so she's gonna join the group up here, so come on up. Now, I'm not, I don't know if I'm supposed to stay up here and ask questions or sit down there, but I think I'm gonna go over there because quite honestly, I need a little water. Can you? That's right. Good, 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 good. Uh, can, can you all hear us on these microphones? So I have a first question, and it kind of goes back to something with myself, and I'd like each of our guests to kind of, what was it like the very first moment you met a president of the United States? How did you feel, and what took place? And maybe we'll start over here. The very first time that all of a sudden you were face to face with the president of the United States. I'm still pinching, me. You are? I'm from DC. You know, we don't hang out in high, hollow places. And if we did, we were working for federal government. And at the time, people in charge of government weren't so cool. So I was not exactly looking forward to it because I already heard tall tales of reality. And as time went on, the first time I saw both of them, I'm like, you're kidding. I'm here. <laughs> I'm being acknowledged. Uh oh. It was deep, because this is the last place on planet Earth I thought I would be. I mean, I've been an activist all my life. I have an FBI record from my time at Ohio State. <laughs> That's good. I That's get good. that people need help, and if we don't help each other, we're not gonna have anything to talk about. There won't yeah. be any pictures, there won't be history. Right. And I used to read a lot of encyclopedias going, look at this president here, this president there. This is what they look like, they got frills on, they got wigs on. I never thought I'd be shooting the president of the United States. Right. Dennis. Well, I started out at GW Law School and I photographed, I worked for the Dallas Morning News and it was, <laughs> I went into some public things with uh, President Kennedy, but the first president I ever knew was LBJ, and he dealt with photographers one-on-one. -on -one. And by that time that I really had a, any dealings was when Newsweek was doing a cover story on LBJ in trouble. And in the Oval Office, there was a, a, a situation of, you see every day on TV with the head of state and the president, and it was King Faisal. He didn't speak a word of English. But LBJ looked over, he knew that I worked for Newsweek, uh, and he looked over and he says, see that man right there? He worked for Newsweek magazine, and he's trying to take the worst picture of me that I possibly could. <laughs> and and, uh, uh, and uh, so, sure enough, uh, that next week, actually, uh, uh, it, I didn't get it that day. The next day he was speaking at the, the Armory, which was the biggest place that we had in Washington for events. Uh, and uh, uh, it's the one by the RFK Stadium. Uh, and different times, big podium like that. You could go anywhere, there were no pools or anything like that. And uh, the DS was way up there. And over there I saw a, a 10 foot ladder. And I just went over and I got that ladder and I put it right in front of him. And bam, 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 it was a cover of Newsweek, LBJ in trouble, in trouble right there. Well, the next mor Monday morning, you had to go in. If you, LBJ, you, you had to go in uh, to see him. And sure enough, Oval Office, and just as we were getting through, he just looked up and says, hey, Newsweek. Uh, <laughs> he never knew my right. name. Uh, and and uh, uh, for fortunately. Uh, and so, uh, he says, you know that cover? He says, uh, I said, yes, yes. I says, I like that picture. I'm looking right at the camera. I says, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that's, it's, it, that's, it's, it's what we call eye contact, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Diane. You know, I don't, I don't remember, which is funny. Um, what I do remember is that um, as a child, um, my birthday fell on January 20th. And so every four years, I thought the parade here in Washington <laughs> was for me. <laughs> and, and so I saw, I saw lots of 
presidents from um, when I was very little. And what I would say about um, all of them uh, that I covered, um, from Gerald Ford to President Carter to President Reagan to President Bush to President Clinton, and that's where I, I stopped, they all were extraordinary men in their way, and they were, um, it was really exciting to be adjacent to them and to watch them work, and it was a real thrill. Well, you know, we look at photography today through our iPhones and those that have cameras, we can take a picture and we look at the back of the camera, we immediately know whether we got the, the right exposure, whether the composition is decent. In the, in the old days, at least when I started in the 50s, uh, we would send the film in and sometimes I never even saw what I shot, the editor, I only saw what, you know, what an editor picked to use and so forth. Uh, and all my film was shipped in undeveloped. So I'd like to talk about some of the experiences that you had. Did you have to ship your stuff in, Dennis, undeveloped? I, I or did. What? And uh, before I worked for Time, I, I, I worked for Newsweek, and there was this, uh, everybody, a lot of photographers swore he was crazy, Bob Engel, but he was a great art director and, and did uh, a wonderful job with your pictures. But, I get this call from Bob Engel, and I'd just done a, 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 a cover shoot on Julie Nixon, uh, and it was after Watergate, and uh, her husband, and uh, got them both in the, he didn't want to get in the picture, but anyway, uh, got them both in there, and I shot uh, three, three rolls with lights, with strobes, but then I did one roll uh, available light, which I knew wasn't very good, but you know, you never knew. Uh, so. Uh, and Bob Engel had this dramatic voice. Dennis, I'm just calling. He had gotten the one roll of available light. Uh, and he says, I'm just calling to ruin your day because you're ruining mine. <laughs> and he's going through this box and then he gets to the second with the lights and uh, uh, he, he uh, oh, 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 this is very good. Uh, boom, it hangs up. <laughs> <laughs> photo editors are like that. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, my editor, photo editor, was Dick Pollard at Life. You remember. So, what was it like shipping film in undeveloped, not knowing really what you got? You covered your butt. You shot as much film as you could. Two reasons. One, it's history. Number two, it's history your way, which means you can't stand in one spot. You got to walk around. I'm a 360 degree person. Wherever the press pool is, or another photographer, I go the other way. Right. Because you don't need 20 dozen pictures from the same angle. It is boring as it can be. Right. So no matter what, I lead a pack, because I had this special pen on. You ain't going to bother me. Ha! No matter where I went, I got bothered, because they're like, you work for who? Who are you? What does this pen mean? I said, I'm going to get you arrested if you don't know what this pen means. <laughs> because it's the Secret Service pen telling you, don't bother me. But no matter where I went, somebody would bother me, and I'd go, kumbaya, my lord, kumbaya, don't kill nobody, don't cuss them out, be nice and polite, and it's going to be all right. That's what I'd say. And sooner or later, I'd have to call, white folk, hey, help! And they'd go, what's the matter, Sharon? This guy's got his hand on his pistol. We're in Butte, Montana. And I'm like, man, and like, she's with us. Don't bother her. And I say, they don't know what the pen means. <laughs> oh, really? We'll go talk to them. And they'd go talk to the person bothering me. <laughs> you know, in, in the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, we didn't have FedEx in those days. And uh, once in a while, there was a company called Network Courier Service. But you, if you were in a foreign country or the Philippines or someplace, you'd take your film if the reporter or the writer wasn't going back. You'd give it to an airline stewardess with five dollars or this or that. And uh, I remember once I was covering Muhammad Ali in the Philippines with Neil Leifer and a bunch of photographers. And we all shipped it back with the same airline stewardess. And they all wound up being published with the wrong credits on. <laughs> because they all got mixed up. 
So shipping your film in undeveloped, what, what's your war story? <laughs> well, it w we never saw our work. Um, and you weren't really very uh, welcomed on Friday night at Time Magazine when they were looking at the pictures and deciding what to use. To have a photographer in the room was a terrible thing, so they kept us very far away. Right. So you had to get used to never seeing your work until it was either published or not published. And it was always humiliating if you were photographing a president doing something and they chose to use a wire picture over your picture. And that was always something. And I'm, I could sit here and tell you all of the things that I did that were wrong over my career because I remember them vividly. Right. But sometimes, not only um, did we shoot the picture, but we also became the courier. And I remember very well being with, with um, uh, Ronald Reagan when he stepped over the line in Berlin at Checkpoint Charlie. And I had to, I was the uh, newest person uh, working for time at that time new kid on, on the, the block. trip. What? You were the new kid on the block. I was the new kid on the block. And so I was the designated traveler. And so Dirk gave me his film, David gave me his film. We put everything in all of the envelopes and a, a car took me um, straight, an advanced man had arranged this, tra straight to Tiedelhof, and I got on an airplane there. I flew to Hamburg. I got on a plane at Hamburg. It was um, Pan Am flight number one that goes around, used to go around the world. And I flew from Hamburg to London, and in London they raced me across the tarmac. You can tell this is way pre, um, you know. TSA. Yes, TSA. <laughs> right. And they ran me across and put me on the um, uh, Concorde. And it was the only time I was ever on a Concorde, Concord. and it was to be a courier. And I went to New York, and I, was, I got a taxi into the building, and I said, here is our film from today. And it was just about 5 o'clock, and they were all ready for it, and said, oh, nice, thanks. And <laughs> I thought I had done something extraordinary. Well, you know, occurring film back and all of this was meeting deadlines. Uh, you know, the general circulation magazine in the 60s and coming out of the 50s was the educator of the, of the world. Television hadn't emerged yet. Probably National Geographic was one of the most important magazines. They had great reproduction. Uh, everybody was proud to be published there. Uh, but it was always a race, as we got into the mid-60s, against television, because television started shooting 16-millimeter newsreel. And uh, I remember the death of the general circulation magazine. Uh, the Pope had died in Rome, and uh, Life magazine had outfitted a 7 or a 747, I can't remember, I think it was a 707, a jet airplane with a dark room and layout rooms and everything. And they had to fly all the way to Chicago to R.R. R. Donnelly, where Life magazine was first printed. It was actually printed three places in the United States, but in Chicago. And the whole thing was to get there before the images of the Pope, which were being flown 16 millimeter, back to the United States was on television. They needed to be on the newsstand on Monday morning. And I have to tell you, Life Magazine lost the race. They didn't make it. And television had the newsreel footage of the Pope's funeral first. So you have to remember, we lived in an era in which we were always in a 50-yard dash. Uh, and you know our responsibilities were not only to preserve history, but to educate the world to what was happening. So, what My do you remember? My responsibility was a little bit different, because okay, I didn't have to me. beat the courier. Okay. We had guys that came and picked up our stuff three times a oh, day. Oh, boy. Like and they had their little metal case, and they come in, get our film, and take it back. Right. It was fine. I like looking at proof sheets with a loop. I'm good at that. When they decided to go electronic and telling me to look at your screen for my proof sheet, I'm like, uh-uh. Where are my proof sheets? 
Right. I come in one day, all my stuff is gone. I'm like, what's this? Not working. Couriers brought our stuff back and forth, so I wasn't sweating it like they were, but I was sweating other stuff. They outside. I'm inside. They got to shoot outside. I can shoot inside. I really got to do a good job. Because if I'm going to show what's going on inside, I got to make sure I'm still competitive with the folk on the outside. <laughs> but the deal about the Clintons is they love photography and their photographers. They love Diana. They love Dennis. We talk about photographers in their work. And I'm like, yeah, she bad. Yeah, he bad. <laughs> and they go, well, Sharon, you're excellent, too. Oh, not compared to these two, because they got to work outside the bubble. I'm working inside the bubble. Did any of you ever have a, a president or a vice president say, I want to see the proof sheets. I think I want to edit what's going out today or, or Evans, whatever. No. 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 <laughs> oh. Anything? It came close to uh, this, and they stopped it, and it wasn't with me, uh, right. on a campaign uh, where we uh, d uh, had our pictures uh, on our computer, and the wire services were uh, uh, processing the, the right, pictures. Sure. Uh, they couldn't send them for the plane, but at that time, right. uh, and the candidate would come back, and uh, that was, you know, somebody went and said, "Hey, we can't have that." Uh, right. And so they didn't do that. But that's the closest I've. But you I've mostly ever edited known. your own work then. Yeah, because if, if you don't edit, edit it, somebody else is going to put something in there that didn't pay attention right. to where the eyes were closed, whether you could see the whole face and not just the back oh, of yeah. the ear. You yeah. edit in the camera as you take the picture. Sure. But um, I have to interject this story because it's so funny. It sort of applies to what you were talking about. There's a story that in the 19, uh, the Reagan first win in 1982, was right. it, yeah. or 1980? Um, there were the, at the Santa Monica airport, there were two private planes, and two guys were sitting in the fountain area there having a burger before their job started, and one of them said to the other, uh, you know, Charlie, I'm doing the damnedest job tonight. He said, I have a G4 or something that uh, has been outfitted with a dark room. And there are dark room technicians in this. Think of this compared to now. Think of this when now all you have to do is press a button and the picture gets there. This is what we went through. He said, this, this Time magazine has outfitted the inside of my jet, and there are two technicians, and the film from the Reagan celebration party is coming here by motorcycle, and we are going to fly to New York while it's processed in the plane, and then a motorcycle's going to take it to Donnelly in Long Island right. and get it in the magazine tomorrow morning. Isn't that the most amazing thing you've ever heard? And Charlie said, no. I'm doing exactly the same for Newsweek. <laughs> uh, I, I, I had a horrible experience once, uh, just prior to JFK's tragic death. Uh, there was a woman uh, known as Madame New. I don't know how many of you remember the Dragon Lady of Vietnam. And uh, her brother was assassinated, I think, by the CIA or somebody. That's when we were really controlling other countries' elections. You know, <laughs> we're objecting to what's going on now, but we, we forget about our own history very quickly. So uh, I, I flew to Rome with her from uh, from L.A. and uh, you know had I was working for Parry Match and I had this kind of an exclusive, but. You know, Mosier, the reporter from Paris Match, came from France, and Madame New wanted to see the pictures first. Uh, and we couldn't figure out at 3 o'clock in the morning where to develop the pictures in Rome. So finally, we woke up the people at AP. Uh, we thought it was AP. We went to the address. We brought the film in there. And uh, all of a sudden, they come out of the darkroom, and they say, everything's so black. They're all overexposed. I said, it's impossible. I thought they'd be underexposed because we hardly had any light. And they had put all the black and white film in color developer. They thought we had shot <laughs> color. And, you know, in those days it was called farmer's reducer, if you remember. So, but the end of the story is, so Madame New looked at the pictures and we gave her one. 
And by the time the pictures got back to Perry Match, one of them was on the front page of a, a Rome communist newspaper. <laughs> so I said to Madame New, I said, well, you know, well, what happened to that prince? She got, and she looked at me and she said, in God we trust, but not God's representatives. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, security of your pictures was also important when you had exclusivity. I think they want us to right. start. Okay, they want us to do Q&A now? No, uh, oh. the pictures. Oh, pictures, oh, okay. Do I push this? Which oh, wow. do I push? I thought they had already shown the pictures. What, what do we do here? All no, right, no, well, let's no, go back, let's no, go back. No, this is, give it to Diana. She, yeah, you, you go ahead. Which one do you push? <laughs> You push this. No. <laughs> Diana knows how to handle a Nikon or a Canon, but uh, this, okay, new technology. Uh, this was, was a, uh, there was a trip um, a, by uh, Queen Elizabeth to uh, California. The Reagans inv had invited her to come, and I was covering her trip, and it poured rain every single day on the trip, and it, she was on her yacht, and it was, she was so wet, and it was terrible. So at the dinner, there was a state dinner at the de Young Museum given, and the Queen said, you know, I know, Mr. President, that when the Puritans came to the new land, that they brought with us, with them, many of our customs, but I had no idea they brought the rotten weather, too. <laughs> this is a picture of um, President Clinton in Red Square, when he returned for the first time since he'd been a student, and it was so different, and he was very moved by it, but he was most, most definitely moved because he went into a cathedral there, and he lit a, cam a candle for his mother who had just died, and ju all of a sudden, tears just came up into his eyes, and it was quite a moment. Uh, this was a Middle East summit that Clinton called, and I was doing a behind-the-scenes uh, act, and um, I was there with um, Callie Shell, who was there with, with the vice president, and um, there were Arafat and Netanyahu sitting there, and I knew that everybody in the world wanted to know if Arafat and Netanyahu were talking to each other, and there I was inside with them on a love seat. Right. <laughs> this is a funny picture that I was extremely lucky to get. I was actually shooting for CBS, and it was a goodbye party for Walter Cronkite that the president gave. He gave him an interview first, which was broadcast that night, and I was hired to photograph the interview. And afterwards, the man in the foreground, Bud Benjamin of CBS, said, quick, come in here. So I went in with my camera, and the president and Walter Cronkite were telling jokes. Now, I asked everybody in that picture <laughs> what the joke was and who was telling it, and do you think they've ever told me? No. <laughs> And this picture, of course, got a great deal of play. Um, it went viral and went, um, became a meme and went all over the world. And I was so upset that, they had, uh, uh, that a Tumblr had stolen it from the Time website. And I, I just didn't understand that Tumblr would take this picture and it would, it would go viral all over the world. And so I wasn't so upset that they had stolen it from time. But this is on a C-17 on a trip with, with Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State going over to Libya. This is a picture of the pre all the presidents, with the exception of Carter, who went to the Nixon, the opening of the Nixon Library. And these statues are in the library, and they are of all the foreign re leaders that Nixon had, um, had met with. And I thought all of the presidents looked exactly like the statues they might be. <laughs> this was uh, President Bush, as you, many of you will remember, went to Thanksgiving with the troops uh, prior to Desert Storm. And these are the, uh, the army in um, the desert of um, Saudi Arabia. And I hadn't 
really taken a good picture. I didn't think all day. And all of a sudden, the sun was going down. We were leaving in about five or 10 minutes. And the president began to sh sh throw souvenirs to the troops of tie clips and key chains. And it just was the most beautiful moment. And I remember holding my camera as tight as I could and just hoping that that image would work. And uh, it did. It won wor World Press that year. What's wrong with you? Oh, there, whoops. Oh, you got to go back. Uh, this is a picture. You know, when the editors um, would photograph, would uh, process my black and white film, which which signaled that it was a behind the scenes thing, that uh, time had asked me a lot to try and get access to the president's behind the scenes. And I would shoot it in black and white because we wanted it to last. We wanted it to signal in the pages of time that this was different. And I was cowering in the corner at the convention of 1996, and there was this huge roar for, for Clinton to come out on stage. And I remember my editor in New York, Michelle Stevenson, saying, you've got the most extraordinary picture of the president taking a deep breath. And I remember saying, I do? Because of course, you know, you're working so hard, and I have a small Leica and very fast black and white film. and. Um, they were all thrilled to have this because as practiced as President Clinton was, he took a deep breath before he went out on stage. Well, that's what he did. Uh, this last one, oh no, second to the last one. Uh, <laughs> I was on assignment following um, uh, Secretary Albright and I was doing a behind the scenes thing and we walked into the, um, a room off the floor of the NATO meeting, which was being held at the Ronald Reagan building. And the president was sitting on the couch, and he asked Madeline to sit next to him. And then in came Senator, uh, Secretary Cohen of Defense, and then Sandy Berger of the, the National Security Council. And the president, and Sharon was there too, and, and we both got the same picture. And the president looked at his wonderful cabinet members to the left and to the right, and he said, you know, we look like those monkeys. You know what I mean? Hear no evil, see no. So they did it, right? <laughs> and then this picture I threw in to show you that we didn't always um, work in the White House or in close prox proximity to the action. The allied leaders from um, from the Second World War, uh, the Allied leaders, representatives of the Allied leaders, came uh, from England to France on D-Day in the Queen's yacht, the Britannia. So I'm covering President Clinton, so that's as close as I could get to the <laughs> Britannia. <laughs> and that's it. Those are the pictures I brought. So if we could have the next set up there. Sharon, okay, there you go. We hit the ground running. We got up early, we stayed up late. He would do runs before 7 a.m. We worked in shifts. If you were the 7 a.m. person, you wanted to get there at least in half an hour before so the team would not leave you but he always had Secret Service agents that also had to keep up with him. So we'd get out the van, we'd be waiting somewhere, waiting for him to roll on by, and they would roll on by. All kind of things happen. You gotta get ready for everything. Before he's doing a broadcast to the nation about some important topic going on, people have set up lights, atmosphere, and things. I'm looking going, whoa, portrait. <laughs> so I started working before everybody else started working. And he knew what I was doing, so he looked at me dead. I'm like, yeah, I got that. <laughs> this was a fun occasion. We're trying to get peace in the Middle East. And he's invited Arafat and Netanyahu to sit down and have lunch. They undo their napkins. They're sitting there starting to talk. 
And then President Clinton says, look at here. We're going to leave you guys to work it up. Next thing I know, he and the King of Jordan are up and out of there. And they shut the door, and I'm running behind them. And they tell the Secret Service and everybody's guards, leave them alone. Don't bother them. Don't let them out. They're in there for at least an hour. <laughs> we want a peace in the Middle East. <laughs> President Clinton listened to everybody. This is Sandy Berger, the national security chief. We started every morning out with what's going on in the world. It would blow my mind that they could handle all of these things that never get said in the paper, never get said in the newspaper or magazine. <laughs> and no matter what, Mrs. Clinton was there too. You brought the president of the whatever country, then you have the first lady of that country too. And everybody's got their own interpreter. So somebody's doing English, somebody's doing Chinese. This is after the big grand soiree on the back of the lawn. Camp David, everybody golfed. I even turned into a golfer. I didn't mean to. <laughs> but when you're out, this guy loved to play golf. They even put a little hole in one out on the back of the South Lawn. We go to Camp David. Lord have mercy, Chelsea liking golf. Mrs. Clinton could hit the ball better than him. Look out. <laughs> we go to Martha's Vineyard, and her and Mrs. Vernon Jordan would go out and do their own thing. And there's no fighting, there's no fussing, everybody's just happy hitting that ball. No matter what's going on in the world, there's a serious stuff that nobody knows about. There's hard decisions to be made. Did I ever think I'm going to Secret Service clearance? No. But I'm hearing all this stuff going, whoa. <laughs> oh, whoa. Sharon, how's your day? Serious. <laughs> serious. Mrs. Clinton did her thing with health care, but she didn't want criticisms about whether or not she's taking care of her man in the White House. So she did the thing for first ladies. Make sure the food is right. What kind of flowers we gonna have? We can do everything. Women do everything. <laughs> this was fun for me, because to me, the Delaney sisters were living legends. One's 104, the other one's 102. They're still doing yoga. They eat garlic every day. You look at them going, and they're talking. They make sense. They don't have Alzheimer's. There's no dementia. I'm like, I'm going to eat garlic every day. I'm going to work out every day. Compassion. The biggest thing for me about President Clinton was he was just not any old guy. He loved people. He was very sensitive. This young lady is the daughter of James Byrd, who was dragged to death in Texas by some Yoho boys who lost control of themselves. She has been to the Texas legislature. She has been to Governor Bush asking for a hate crimes bill. We didn't get it. President Clinton comes to the airport. She comes. Next thing I know, she's crying. He's hugging trying to comfort say, we will get a hate crimes bill. I love my panorama camera. You got to get the idea about who all is in the room. Notice that it's Rahm Emanuel over here on the left-hand side who went on to be mayor of Chicago. Hey, Rahm, you did a good job as domestic, but you got a lot of work to do as mayor of Chicago. <laughs> Mandela was like dying and going to heaven. When I was younger, we marched around the embassy of South Africa trying to free Nelson Mandela. I never thought I would see it in my lifetime. I never thought I worked for a president of the United States. And lo and behold, Lord, I'm in South Africa shooting him getting sworn in. Oh, Lord. And then he comes to the White House. You know I could die that day. I lived all right. <laughs> this is a lonely job. When you get through with your advisors, and all the things you got to talk about and think about, you got to figure out how you're going to tell the people what the deal is. That walk by yourself, that's the loneliest walk in the planet Earth. But there he goes. He was a very extraordinary kind of guy because he understood what pleasure came pain, what pain came pleasure. He understood the yin and the yang, and he was nice to everybody. We're late all the time because he's got one more hand he wants to shake. He sees one more eye going, Please come over here. He step over barriers to get to people. Man, that's my kind of person. 
Diana talked about we're in the same room at the same time. I'm off at a different angle. But the deal is, you know when you see something. Photographers know. He does his own speech, whatever you've given him for a speech, he gonna fix it his way. Whatever words you had, he's gonna put a nuance on it, put another turn on it. He ends up owning that speech. And when he talks that speech, he is not reading from notes. This guy read history. He read books. He'd always ask us, what have you read lately? Let me tell you what I read. And I'm hearing about books I never thought about, but he's thinking, he's writing. This is the lower level of the mansion. And before we go out to the uh, uh, South Lawn to do what we're doing, he's already changing the speech for the umpteenth time. That's me. You would think he'd be around a, a swimming pool or something. It's, a, it's the heliport of the Bethesda Naval Hospital. And it happened just like that, like lightning. Uh, and of course, Charlie Tasnetti and I took the picture and we were sure he was gonna get up and walk and get in our face. But he didn't. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, a real classic uh, picture that you've seen a lot. Uh, and it wouldn't have happened or we wouldn't have gotten the picture if it hadn't been for some Nixon advance men that said, hey, you need a ladder, because at the last minute, they're gonna bring these troops. If we had been on the ground, we would have been in trouble. And then we had taken pictures of the president walking down, uh, go, saying goodbye, and this is 36 uh, exposures on a roll with a motor drive, and then he gets up there, and we're all on frame 29 or something, and he starts waving, you know. And with photography, you don't know what's next. This might be the best. So you take that, and then you do that. And, and, and George Thames, very famous photographer, he was right next to me, and he said, oh my God, oh my God. He was right on the, on the cusp. And this is about th frame 35 for me. <laughs> now, that's, that's uh, uh, Bush 41's chief of staff, Dick Darman. He couldn't see through this costume. It was, it was, <laughs> and, and, and so uh, he, uh, uh, you know, he greeted, everything went fine at the helicopter, but he's trying to get away, and he ran into his boss. Uh, and uh, he was sure he was gonna get fired, but of course, Bush 41, he, he loved it, that's it. Now this has happened to all of us. <laughs> all of us, believe me. But I'll tell you something. He didn't pick up. <laughs> this is on the Truman balcony. Probably one of the one or two pictures. I, I don't know who else ever got above the first floor in the Carter years. Uh, it, looks like, it, it looks like Jimmy's going to take the picture and invite me to dinner. Uh, he didn't. <laughs> he, he greeted me but by saying, what are you doing here? Uh, and turns out, uh, uh, Time was doing a cover story on Rosalind, and Bonnie Angelo, uh, who is a Time reporter, had convinced her. And, 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 and the first lady came in and said, now, Jimmy, they want a picture. This is our favorite time, and they want a, our favorite place, uh, and uh, they just want a picture. So he sat down, and nothing, and then he put his, his leg up there, and I had it, and I said, that's it. It got out of there, too. Uh, <laughs> This is uh, uh, the opening of the Reagan Library. The Reagan advanced people were brought together because he was out of uh, office by that time. And they did what advanced men do well. They asked the photographers what would make the best picture. And they had a lot of them, Kennerly and uh, uh, a lot of photographers. And uh, we decided on this courtyard, uh, which was on their walk from they had just toured uh, the, the museum together and were in the Oval Office. And I've got a great story. If you'll have to ask me, but I've got to get through these. Uh, it's a wonderful story. Uh, ask me. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, that uh, they walked by. And uh, we love to get a lot of presents together. That's one of our things. Now look at this. 
there, this is Ford. They just built this new swimming pool, and he uh, swam every day. Everybody wanted a picture of that. David Kennerly said uh, to, to his boss, the president, he says, uh, photographers want a, a, a picture. He says, well, tell them to come on by on Saturday. So we all went by, and uh, uh, he swam, got out, told a few jokes. But I've got to show you this. This robe here, this terry cloth robe, no presidential seals, no nothing. Those are his topsiders that he had on where Janney's Lane, his, his house. It was just Jerry Ford. That was it. That's a, uh, let's see if this... Ah, oh, there we go. This is sort of the, the outside after Diana's and all the behind the scene uh, on the south lawn of, of one of the peace signings. Uh, this, I was the most ill-equipped uh, uh, Life magazine photographer to cover the assassination. I, I was... I had sold some pictures to life, uh, and uh, I just went up, and uh, uh, Hank Saddam, the bureau chief, uh, said, uh, uh, yeah, go, went Lafayette Park, and then we called in, with no cell phones, was, uh, uh, pay phones, says, get to Andrews Air Force Base. Went to Andrews, I had no press credentials, and uh, Sissy Morrissey, the life uh, reporter, had her business card, that was it. And says, I'm from Life Magazine at the gate, and says, this is my photographer, and they says, yes, sir. That's it. That was security. This was, this was made with my longest lens, which was an 85 millimeter. Uh, the wire services did have that 400 millimeter Kelvin. Uh, Johnny out, Rouse yeah. made that picture. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, the Obamas uh, had children. Uh, and they were sure we were going to have a real fight on their hands. Uh, uh, or they were. We weren't. We had a rule. The wire services, everybody got together. You only photograph the children when their pit parents are in the frame. And it worked. Uh, they, we really had very little trouble with that. It was not like the Amy Carter days of things. Let's see. Uh, this is the last picture <laughs> of of uh, these two presidents talking together amicably. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, this is in the Oval Office, of course. And uh, uh, if you'll notice, uh, Trump does that a lot, uh, his, his listening mode. Anyway, <laughs> if he's listening, uh, maybe he is. I don't know. Anyway, this is a, a really important picture for the story. Uh, uh, this is uh, Gorbachev and uh, Reagan in Iceland, in Reykjavik. Uh, they were supposed to come out at like 6 o'clock. Uh, and uh, Diana, you were, you were someplace else at that time, I think. On that. I was waiting to take the film to the Cytex machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. Uh, the, uh, it, w it just went on. And it was way late at night. Uh, and uh, so they came out. and. Hugh Seide, who was the Time Bureau Chief, we had these walkie-talkies. And Hugh says, there is something wrong here. And Time was holding, but not for our pictures. Uh, it was, uh, uh, they had a cover of them waving and happy, which they liked. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, he said, something's wrong here. And he called up and says, basically, stop the presses. Uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, we still had the lab. We, we uh, uh, had, it, had it open. Uh, David Kennerly, Dirk Halstead, and, and my, uh, David's picture was identical to this, and it was the cover of Time. But, uh, and they held not for the, the pictures. They held because they didn't know what the story was. But the next mo Monday morning, Time magazine, this was like Saturday night, uh, Time magazine came out with that picture, and Newsweek came out with the smiling happy, which was not the story at all, of course. Uh, but, uh, uh, and this uh, is, uh, uh, this is in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, and uh, uh, motorcades and open cars uh, are just fantastic. You, I mean, you, uh, I mean, it's, it's a photographer's delight, and, and, and thanks, uh, uh, and open cars. Uh, they're great for photographers. The presence, maybe not so much, but anyway. <laughs> and that's it for me, I believe. <laughs> me.
say that. Uh, I, I, I think the time has come for you members of the audience to challenge us to uh, come on up to the microphones on the right and left and, uh, you know, uh, pin us against the wall and ask us that question that uh, uh, you shouldn't be afraid to ask. So please, where would the young lady over there, if you'd like to start. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering how you got to that point in your career where you're photographing the presidents. All of you, I guess. When, when, we're, when we're photographing what? Like how you got to that point in your career, like what led up to that, where you started off? You always show your best. You always show what you can do. If somebody can decide a picture's yours before they read the photo credit, you are on your way. That's right. That's how I got there, because a guy had his wife call me and said, we, we want to hire you. And I thought somebody was playing a joke, so I hung up on her. <laughs> I'm trying to get 30 prints out before 11 o'clock. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm a behind kind of person. And she calls back a second time, and she starts again. I'm like, I ain't got time for this. I hung up again. When she calls back the third time, she says, listen, you, we went to a party last night. Half the room knows you and your phone number. Then she says where they've been. And I'm like, well, I know all them people. And she says, my husband's going to call. This is Bob McNeely that hired me that worked for Newsweek magazine. And he was going to be Clinton's personal photographer. And he said, I know your work before I see your name. I want you to come work for me. It don't get better than that. Yeah. I think uh, you have to have uh, mentors uh, that uh, kind of adopt you and see that you have a good eye and you can do the job. Uh, and I had uh, uh, that with Black Star Publishing Company. Howard Chapnick uh, was the owner uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, went up there with the interview uh, at old Mr. Meyer who used to, and it was one of those, inter it, it, this actually happened, looked at the picture, he says, uh, uh, do you have a day job? And I says, well, I'm in law school. He goes, stay in law school. <laughs> 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 yeah. But Howard, uh, we talked and uh, he had great faith in me and uh, over the years uh, he uh, uh, got me uh, any, any bit of a, a assignments that I, I, I've got, and uh, I don't think I ever let him down. Well, I, um, it, it makes me laugh when I think of why I think I got my contract at time. Um, I, there were two things that happened. One, I went to see a lady who someone knew call, uh, who was a picture editor at Money Magazine, and I was really nervous and I went in to see her and I showed her tear sheets from things I'd done for the Village Voice or the Washington Monthly Magazine here that really gave me my start. And I showed her everything and she looked at all of it and she closed it and she said, I'm not the slightest bit interested in your work. And I went, oh God. And she said, but I know who will be. And she got on the phone and she called Fortune, Time, and People for me. And I saw them all that day. So that was um, a, a good start. Uh. <laughs> the gentleman over there on the left. Hello. Um, how did you the, separate it between being a Peruvian fly on the wall and the relationship you started to develop with the presidents? What was that? Could you repeat the again. question again? How did you separate between that relationship you've been developing with the president and being outside of it so you can actually capture the moments, the Peruvian fly in the wall as it's known? Two reasons why you can do that. First one is you want to do the best job you can do. Everybody doesn't get in there and you can't always be agreeable with your boss. And people who know me know I work for other people. They know sometimes I don't agree with the boss. And always, when you don't agree with the boss, take your picture and move. So they can't grab you, can't talk to you. If they can't talk to you, you go do what you want. I had an arsenal of camera lenses, so no matter where I was, I'm going to get my picture. And then he can't argue, can't talk to me. All he can do is see stuff on the wall. We did golfing with uh, Michael Jordan in Las Vegas, and the other photographer didn't get shots of Sports Illustrated golf. I'm running with the press pool. So I'm getting my Sports Illustrated, I got my 400 millimeter lens, I'm dead on it. He liked that, because he came to me going, where the proof sheets? This other stuff doesn't have me and Michael shooting. 
I had that. He came down on a Saturday. Sharon. Yes, sir. Can you do this? Yeah. So that's the relationship. But if I didn't have that work, had that good work, I'd have been mud. I'd have been bad mud. I, did you ask how one you separate. separates? separates. Um, when you go into photojournalism, you know what it's all about. You're a journalist who uses a camera. You don't use a pencil. You use a camera and you use your eye. And you see what you see and you have a point of view and that's the way it is. Uh, so it should never be a problem. Uh, yeah, I had a, a couple of situations being a journalist. Uh, uh, one was Mike Deaver uh, who really controlled Ronald Reagan and, and, and things and I was not going to pull any punches. Uh, and uh, so Reagan was losing the Florida primary and it was raining in Tampa and uh, gets off the plane and I knew he was going to come through that puddle and make a mess. And I went on the other side and just was ready. And Mike looked at me and glared because he knew that that was going to be a bad picture of, of Reagan. <laughs> There's nothing he could do. He couldn't call time or anything. But he could in a subtle way they found another photographer, and when you're with a candidate, you are with him. Uh, and uh, uh, he found another photographer, gave him some behind the scenes, uh, Michael Evans, and, and, and that worked very well for Michael because they hit it off very well. Uh, and uh, uh, things. so th they can control, they, the, the establishment or uh, the handlers, that's the only way they can control uh, what they can. They, they can't go for you personally and uh, say uh, th that uh, uh, this is wrong, you know, you shouldn't do that. I've never had that, but it, there's a subtle way that, that they can do that. And that's, it happens very seldomly. I came from actually a different background because I, living on the West Coast, was a total freelancer. Even though I may have had contracts with magazines to give them so many days a year, I was on my own, and most of the stories that I was assigned, even whether it was Nixon or whatever, I had to ingratiate myself and allow myself as much as possible to be a fly on the wall, as the saying goes. Uh, and there were some pretty bad, you know, uh, situations. Uh, sometimes you become even the reporter besides being the photographer. Uh, I met a, a gentleman in 1968, who you'll all know who the name was uh, in a minute, and uh, I convinced one of his girls to tell me the story of the Tate LaBianca murders. And Susan Atkins, I didn't take any pictures of her right away, she started telling me uh, about what took place that night. Well, what was the end result of it? Charlie Manson bombed the front of my house blew out the door. So sometimes you take risks as, you know, you were in the Gulf Wars, you know. Uh, I got involved with a lot of controversial stories, not only to take pictures, but to tell the story behind the pictures. The camera, to me, was like a sponge. I was absorbing what was there. I was preserving. And, and the thing that I learned is that I didn't know on many occasions what would be important. History is what made a lot of pictures important. Uh, being there at the right time, yes, that's important. Having an eye, understanding composition, probably more than anything else is understanding light. And because, you know, photography doesn't exist in, in, without light. And I'll end this little part of the story by when I made my first real big motion picture, I'd made a couple, and I hired a cinematographer by the name of Vittorio Storaro, and we went to make an eight-hour miniseries in the Soviet Union called Peter the Great. And I remember the very first day on the set, we were going to shoot a minuet, and I went over to Vittorio, and I said, Vittorio, you know, maybe we should move the camera from here or there. And Vittorio looked at me and says, Oh, I only care about the light. You go speak to Enrico, you know. It's the light that's going to make the picture. And I think to lead into a question before we get some more questions, 
Did you struggle with lights? I mean, sometimes we brought strobes, but for those that don't know what strobes were, they were electronic lights that worked off of batteries or through AC. But, you know, light is what makes our pictures. How many times did you feel you were in the wrong spot and the light wasn't good? Or no, uh, lots. <laughs> lots. <laughs> light know. was always good. I kept moving, I kept changing lenses. Right? Light was never bad. Right, yeah. <laughs> that time, uh, never, uh, and especially Newsweek, they didn't like green pictures, and that's what you got with available light. Right, and sure. And we, for, for years, if it didn't happen where our strobe said, right. it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and not, so, at the, yeah. not at the White House, because they, they would light things. Right. Um, but certainly on Capitol Hill, um, we would be trudging along carrying strobes. Right. I learned lighting in a very strange way. When I was about 16, uh, in those days, you could listen to the police band at the end of an FM band. The police didn't have their own channels in San Diego. So I used to get on my bicycle and go to an automobile accident. And by the time I get there, the cars would have been towed away, the police would have left, the ambulance would have left. And all I had was skid marks. And I started to photograph skid marks, but I didn't realize I was learning about light. You know, backlighting, cross lighting, overcast lighting. You know, I'd move three feet to the left and the highlight would pick up the oil in the skid marks and I'd see it a little better. So sometimes you learn about things by osmosis and you don't even realize what you're learning. At least that happened to me at a young age. The young lady over there? I think she was first, actually. But you have another, what? Oh, she was first. I'm, I'm a different person than the other person. Oh, a different yeah. person. Uh. Oh, I apologize. I saw something red there. Oh, and, no, and I, okay. Please, Pajalsta. Hi. Um, thanks, y'all, for coming to speak. It's been really awesome hearing your stories. Um, my question is, what do you see, or how have you seen the role of photojournalism evolve? And especially in today's day and age where everyone has a camera in their pocket and the ability to publish a photo online to the world. Um, how you, how, you know, how photojournalism, professional photojournalism can maintain its importance in telling history or educating the public as you guys were talking about. Thanks. Please. What, I, I think you asked, what do we do today? Well, how, how do you see your role in other photojournalists uh, who... <laughs> Luckily, or, or, I'm retired. Well, <laughs> other, you know, if you were starting your career right now, how would you, you know, how would it be different in an era where I have a smartphone and can take a picture and upload it to the internet and my photo could go viral like yours did, I guess? I think it's a really good question. Um, and I get asked it quite a lot, and I don't have an answer. Uh, the kind of work um, that we did is, is, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Time Magazine, for instance, doesn't have a photographer assigned to the White House anymore. They are relying on the wire services there. It is, um, there are so many fewer magazines, there are online magazines, and there's that, it's, it's a conundrum. And it is, um, it is true that everybody has a camera in their pocket now. And so competition is extraordinary, speed is extraordinary. And I think the best place out there um, for, for freelance photographers is to be an in-house photographer for something, um, we have a, a wonderful photographer for time who was here who's now become the in-house photographer for Apple. And there is that. But the freelancers I know who are going to the Middle East and getting in, risking their lives in fact, to get those fantastic pictures that they take, they have to get them somewhere really fast um, to have them used and appreciated. I, I'm going to jump in and say something. You know, I think there is a modern day Life magazine and a modern day Time magazine. And that is the New York Times. I have to tell you, their photography is really extraordinary. They have photographers all over the world. And one of the most important things with, whether it's an Apple, iPhone, 
or a Nikon or whatever you're using, you have to have taste. You have to understand composition. And if you understand li light, your pictures will stand out on Instagram. They will rise to the surface. And I think you still have to learn the basic skills. And remember, 100 years or 50 years or 10 years from now, the form of communication will be entirely different. This will be maybe forgotten. But if you have taste, you understand light, you understand composition, and you understand the little bit of history, and you can put in your pictures something that really tells not only the moment, but tells a little bit about what came before, you will rise to the surface. If you do exhibitions, if you do discussions about photography, if you talk to other folk about why you have to pay attention to composition, why you can't let the phone booth just run up the back of somebody's head? <laughs> why if they're blinking, it's not a good picture? Why if they're just standing there like that smiling at you, there's no action? Com competition is still where it's at in the visual arts. Journalism is part of the visual arts. Documentary photography is part of the visual arts. There's so many aspects, all you gotta do is go, I'm gonna get two from that column and two from that column and go for it. Because no matter which two pictures you put up, you're gonna like one better than the other. And you wanna have the discussion about what that means. Watching TV is not where it's at. No. But going out to exhibitions, photo discussions, I learned stuff tonight, hello. So you can have more fun being with people and not just being at a computer that doesn't talk to you. You know, go take your iPhone and go stand on a corner for four hours and look with your eye and find the images that are taking place on that street. You know, stand and be patient. You don't have to shoot right away. And then, then decide what story do I want to tell about this street corner. You know, when I started, I remember my mentor put an apple in front of me and said, sit there for three hours, Larry, and as the sun moves, look what happens to that apple. It's gonna change shape, it's gonna look different, and it's gonna feel different. And uh, don't be afraid just to go out on a street corner and see what you discover. Let's go on, I think. Uh, Another question over there. Hi. Um, so this is kind of more of a technical question, but I'm really curious. If you had to choose your favorite type of film to shoot on, what would it be? You said Ty film? Type yeah. of film? Type yeah. of film. I'm trying to learn film, so. I'm trying to learn film. Oh, you're going back to film. Good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> what kind of film? <laughs> She's asking what kind of film to work on. Go ahead, Dennis. Oh, uh, well, uh, Tri-X uh, would be. Right, sure. Yeah, I mean, that's the. It's black and white, it can do anything. Uh, you can push it and uh, right. uh, it, it's there when you need it, uh, but it also holds up. Uh, the grain structure is nice too. Yeah. yeah. Is there 3200 anymore? Mm, no, 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 no. Only in my refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> the young lady over here. Dennis, you mentioned a story that you were going to tell us about the Reagan Library. <laughs> Great. It's, it's not my story. It's uh, along with the, the uh, people that came to the library, uh, they brought the old official photographers, the ones like Sharon. Uh, uh, that, <laughs> not, not the old, from old presidents. And, and one of them was Bill Fitzpatrick, uh, who yeah. was a wonderful guy. And he was, remember I told him there was a, the outside, uh, there was 3,000 people out here, and the, the library is here, and this courtyard, and we're here. Over here was the replica of the Oval Office. And all the guys in the picture, all the presidents, got in the Oval Office. And Fitz was just a fly on the wall, uh, and he, uh, uh, listened, and one president started telling a war story about what he was, was uh, uh, his time in the Oval Office. Yeah, that desk I was there, and you know, LBJ's probably talking about Vietnam, or, or, or no, uh, uh, Nixon's probably talking about Vietnam and, uh, and all this, and, and, and one of them topped the other one, and, and they kept going. 
And it was really hot that day. And these 3,000 people, they running behind. And uh, one of the presidential aides came in and says, uh, President's up. Uh, you know, there's 3,000 people. And it was supposed to be 11 o'clock, and it's 11.15. And they all look and says, let them wait. <laughs> 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 Kept telling stories. That, that's it. <laughs> Anything else? Please. No, I, I don't have a, a question, but I just have some heartfelt thank yous um, for such a wonderful program and a vibrant discussion. Thank you very much. And I'd like, and I'd like to encourage everyone to come back and see the exhibition on view. It closes September 17th, but plan on coming back again and again. Thank you all for coming this evening. <laughs>